There is a saying, God created the earth, but the Dutch created the Netherlands, which has been quoted at me many times, half jokingly, but not without a pinch of pride. While it is commonplace to rationalize coastal adaption in the Netherlands of today as a necessity because of rising sea levels and the ongoing intensification of the low-lying parts of the territory, the vulnerability of the country is a product of multiple centuries of working the ground. During the Middle Ages, the muddy grounds of the Netherlands posed a major challenge to farmers. Frequent floods not only threatened their crops, but also their settlements. Many farmers began to build ditches around their grounds, as with the help of gravity, forced the water out of the land to be worked. At the same time, the peat-rich grounds proved to be the most efficient resource for generating heat. Pieces of muddy earth were dug out, formed into brickets, and put to dry until eventually they became utilized as fuel. There is a general understanding that centuries of digging peat led to the drastic sinking of the already low-lying land. The uncovering of the protective layer of earth reignited oxidation of the organic material in the soil. This led to an accelerated compaction and losses well beyond the amount that was originally dug out. The Netherlands became exposed to the sea while at the same time trying to fight it. This logic seems to prevail until the present day, with new tools, methods, and ambitions leading, uh, being developed along the way. Today, about a quarter of the Netherlands lies below sea level, and half of the country is less than one meter above sea level. Without its numerous dikes, dams, polders, and coastal nourishments, this part of the country, according to projections, would be lost to the sea. Ironically, it is the constant re-engineering of the country that increases the very likelihood of flooding. Drainage issues, siltation and algae bloom, as well as faster erosion of nourished coasts, are only some of the consequences of reclamation works. They create new problems and the need for improved solutions. The Netherlands could be thought of existing in a constant beta mode, with every engineering fix laying the groundwork and the necessity for the next one. While the reason for converting sea into land are manifold, they might be of env environmental, economic or geopolitical concern, they all have in common that the newly created land is made to stay. Sand motor, an artificial peninsula close to the Hague, is of a different nature. It is the first land reclamation project designed to disappear. Sandmotor is the name of a heap of 21.5 million cubic meters of sand which were dredged from the bottom of the North Sea and temporarily relocated to the Delftland coast in 2011. Over the course of 20 years, the sandy peninsula is supposed to disintegrate and spread along the coast via the natural forces of currents, wind and water. Sand motor is considered a more flexible alternative to the annual coastal nourishment that has been applied to the Netherlands since the 90s. But sand motor is more than just a coastal nourishment project. It is a living laboratory that provides researchers with the opportunity to study changes in real life conditions. To manipulate the coastline, the entire coastal system, that is the sandbanks in front of the coastline, as well as the dunes behind the coastline were taken into account. Varying waves, currents and wind conditions add to the calculation. Finally, the kind of activity that takes place on the coast is factored in to arrive at an approximation with an uncertainty rate that seems manageable. Based on the model's prediction, the shape and location of the heap of sand was derived and its dissolution over the course of 20 years calculated. 
In this way, the hook-shaped peninsula was designed. Since its establishment, sand mortar has been under constant surveillance. Its performance tracked in order to learn from its behavior and feed that knowledge back into the mathematical models. The engineer's numerical model, create, uh, created to mimic the coastline, reduced its complexity to key variables or to those that appear to be significant. These parameters are defined together with the stakeholders, that is, the local government, citizens, environmentalists, and so on. Data captured from the confined and controllable environment of the experiment is then scaled up to the size of a strip of coast and sand volume and location are determined. The coastline becomes largely homogeneous, with heterogeneity existing only in a predefined rate of variance. Even though model and coastline are never the same, difference is factored in as risk, leaving the overall goal of control unchallenged. In the engineering manual of Theo Delft, risk is described as quote, the probability of an undesired event multiplied by the consequences, unquote. Consequences, be they of social, material or symbolic nature, are usually expressed in terms of monetary value. Monetary value is applied because it is assumed that risk can be mitigated by adding measures and compensating for losses. More so when expressed in numerical values, Two completely, two completely different ecosystems suddenly become comparable and thus interchangeable. It also means that losses on an individual level are equated to benefits on a societal level, for example, the replacement of a village versus the economic prosperity of, an, of a nation. The flood of 1421, also known as St. Elizabeth's flood, is considered to be the beginning of the dredging industry. It destroyed huge parts of what is now known as the south of the Netherlands. The scope of reclamation needed to recover land exceeded well beyond the capacity of individual farmers or their financial means and labor force and led to their coalition in so-called water boards. This first communal organization precedes institutional democracy by several centuries and is emblematic of the strong ties between economy, politics, and engineering that is unique to the Netherlands. Farmers are considered to have been the first engineers, and engineers in their function as grandmasters controlled the fate of the country. What started as a means to keep the status quo and protect the country, with the industry's growing professionalization, became an expertise and an expert good. The Dutch Golden Age, the period between 1600 and 1800, was significant for the, intervention, for the invention of new tools and is considered a triumph for hydraulic engineering. It is important to acknowledge that this success is largely based on the exploitation of colonies abroad. The establishment of the Dutch East India Company in 1602 <clears throat> freed up capital at home and opened up new markets for Dutch engineers. Much of today's expertise and business relations are rooted on colonial ties between the Netherlands and Southeast Asia. Only after having applied their engineering approaches abroad did Dutch engineers become aware of the specificity of the Dutch geomorphology. Blessed with an apparently endless supply of sand within its territorial waters, and a steady positive net flow from the south of Europe, sans global scarcity, is of little concern to the Netherlands. Dutch designs, largely sand-based, thus today fuel major conflicts in sand-scarce places. As social scientist and geographer Doreen Massey emphasizes in her theory of power ge geometries, quote, space is always a process of, in a process of being made, 
In this sense, space is a product of our ongoing world. The production of space is a social and political task, unquote. Space and power, according to Massey, have to, have to be understood relationally. Sand as such is an envelope for all kinds of things. Defined only by its crane size, it, is usually, it usually consists of rocks, minerals, shells and plants. The most common ingredient of sand is quartz, making up for about 70% of all naturally occurring sands. In theory, however, anything that has a crane size between 2, uh, 0.06 and 2 millimeters is considered sand. Sand is a granular material. Depending on the interaction between individual grains and the environment, it changes the behavior. Dry sand acts like a liquid. Once wet, sand resembles a solid. Strong wind causes sand to dispense in the air, to jump seemingly chaotically. Until recently, the physics of sand have been considered surprising and counterintuitive and there is no satisfactory mathematical model available that can account for its multi-phase behavior. The piping setup you saw, uh, the one that's over there. Yeah. So these are two cameras uh, on top. So this is the fine set, and this is the exit, so the water flows from that side. These are cameras which are positioned on like this and this. And then you'll see a pipe for me. Despite sand being one of the most widely applied construction materials in the world, its granular physics poses problems for its precise calculability. Instead, scientists conduct isolated laboratory experiments and scale up their findings to larger ecosystems via numerical models. Scaling leads to losses and reduces accuracy, a problem which cannot be solved through advancing computational power.
As anthropologist Gabriel Hecht reminds us, quote, scale is not just about size or granularity, it is also about categories, what they reveal or hide, the ways in which they do or do not nest. And it is about orientation, how we position ourselves, what we position ourselves against, and what comparisons such locations do or do not authorize, unquote. Understanding the complex behavior of granular material emerges from the desire to manage it. Geographer Michael Valland particularizes this observation when stating, quote, how effectively we can maintain harbors, dams, rivers, and coasts depends on our understanding of sand movement, and movement depends on size, unquote. In other words, how sand is defined has to be understood in conjunction with its resourcification. Land reclamation is frequently applied as a speculative investment for industrial and touristic development. Often it is not the new land itself that creates revenue. In fact, it might even prove to generate negative revenue. But expert knowledge, practices and tools developed along the way are subject to a massive expert industry and Grand Dutch engineers' lucrative commissions abroad. A project might not result in a direct return of investment, but it indirectly pays into the Dutch brand, justifying the capital expenditure in the long run. The real sand motor, after almost 10 years of existence, turned out to be quite different to the projections. Not only did its shape transform in unexpected ways, but according to its latest predictions, it is supposed to last for 40 to 50 years instead of the initial 20. Additionally, a lot of sand is lost to the sea, undermining its initial core function as alternative coastal nourishment. Yet, in the manner of flexible adaption, the function of sand motor target. In official sources, the project reads as so innovative that it puts the Netherlands back on the world map of coastal management. Sand motor has been hailed as quintessentially Dutch, a leading example of innovative coastal management, as well as just a beautiful place to be.